Good morning, friends. Uh, welcome to The Well. My name is Ryan Gear. I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here, and uh, it's so great to have you with us today. If you're new with us, we want you to know that you're our guest, and uh, love to hear from you. If you want to let us know you're here, just text the word WELCOME to that number you see, 480-530-7234, and uh, it'll text you back with a digital Connect card. Tell us about yourself, and uh, you can get more info about The Well. So, welcome this morning. Today, we're continuing our series, Distressed, living uh, in an age of American anxiety. As of last month, 35% of Americans reported symptoms of anxiety that could actually be diagnosed as generalized anxiety disorder. That's double what it was uh, six years ago, up five points since January. We are living in one of the most anxious times in American history. And in this series, we're talking about the common things that we're anxious about. Uh, we talked about politics the first week. Last week we talked about finances. And today we're talking about anxiety from COVID-19. Now, of course, all these things are connected. You can't really talk about one without talking about the other, but today we're focusing specifically on anxiety related to the pandemic, COVID-19. So I want to begin by acknowledging at least two ways that we feel anxiety connected to COVID-19. The first way is obvious. You may be anxious because you're afraid that you or someone you love will contract COVID-19 and have a bad reaction. Most cases are mild, but some are not. And because of that, 167,000 Americans have lost their lives to COVID-19. And it's not just death that is the risk, but there are many other long-term effects that are still being studied. So of course you would feel anxiety related to the fact, or just to the fear that you might get COVID-19 or somebody you love might get it and have a bad reaction. Well, of course, doctors and, and uh, medical professionals are telling us the way to reduce our risk is to physically distance, to wear a mask, uh, to maybe even wear a shield. If you're somebody that you, you really wanna protect yourself, you could wear a face shield. And uh, that we limit our contact with one another and, and wash our hands and don't touch our face. And those are all effective ways to reduce the risk of contra uh, contracting COVID-19. So that's one type of anxiety that, that's connected to COVID-19. Let me see if you would agree with me here. I might be more anxious about the second type of anxiety connected to COVID-19, and that is all of the misinformation and the politicization of COVID-19 and the propaganda, the lies that have been put out uh, for political reasons regarding COVID-19 and the fact that there are so many people in this country who believe those lies, who accept misinformation. They, they believe the propaganda and they don't take COVID-19 as seriously as medical professionals tell us to, as seriously as anybody would using common sense when 167,000 Americans have died. I think I'm more anxious about that. Of course, I don't want somebody I love to get COVID-19 I've, I've been on edge more recently about that because my wife's a teacher. But she is more at risk, and frankly, all of us are more at risk because of that second source of anxiety. The fact that there is so much misinformation and politicizing of COVID-19, and the fact that so many people believe that misinformation has caused it to spread far more than it should have, and has put all of us at greater risk. We are less safe because of the propaganda and so many people who have believed it. So I don't know if that's true of you, true of you but I just feel at least two sources of anxiety connected to COVID-19. And so that's what we're talking about today. And, and because we're living in a time of so much misinformation, we need to look at facts. So, so quickly, here is some truth about COVID-19 in the United States. Now, you're not going to be able to read the fine print here, but you can see the bar graph. And at, these are the 
COVID-19 cases per million inhabitants, and this is adjusted per capita. So for po folks who say, well, we just have such a high occurrence of COVID-19 because we have a, a higher population. No, this is adjusted per capita. So number one in the world is the country of Chile, then Kuwait, then Panama, then the United States, then Peru, followed by Brazil, Singapore, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Sweden. But then notice as you get down to the bottom of this graph, these countries have nearly half the occurrence of COVID-19 cases as we do here in the United States per capita. Again, you're not going to see the fine print, but hopefully you can see the lines. This is as of, as of July. This is comparing COVID-19 cases per million people in the United States versus Europe, Canada, and Japan. We're the top line. This is the explosion of COVID-19 cases in the United States versus Europe, Canada, and Japan. Your American passport right now can get you into a few countries. Turkey, uh, some others, I forget. And there are other countries where you can get in, but because you're an American, you have to quarantine for 14 days. An American passport isn't worth much right now because per capita, we are one of the leading countries in the world for coronavirus cases, adjusting for our population. Why? I would suggest it's connected to that second source of anxiety. Misinformation, propaganda, lies, the unwillingness to listen to doctors and, and medical science and to try to sweep COVID under the rug as though that would ever be a winning strategy. And that's led to the deaths of so many Americans and the suffering of so many more. So as we talk about COVID-19, I, I wanted to just take a quick overview of the last 25 years since January. Doesn't it feel like that? And like January, what? Uh, I can't remember what happened in January. That was, it's just too long ago. Too much has happened since then. Actually in December of last year, Dr. Lee, a doctor in the Wuhan Central Hospital discovered a new disease. He said, this is, this is, this is something new. And he sounded the alarm and he paid a price for that. <laughs> Even before he died, he paid a price. And then he died from COVID-19 on February 7th of this year. The first confirmed case in the United States was in January. On January 31st, the World Health Organization issued a global emergency. Um, uh, March 6th through 21st, a cruise ship was stranded off the coast of California. Do you remember that? Because so many people tested positive for COVID and, and they weren't allowed to dock. On March 11th, the NBA suspended its season. And I think in the popular consciousness in America, it's probably sports that got everybody's attention where we realized, man, we just have to do something about this. We can't just keep ignoring this. And, and that was the week that we had to decide that wow, we have to cancel in-person worship services. I talked to our leaders and I talked to a, a nurse here in our congregation and, and we said, yeah, we can't have worship services in person this Sunday. And so we went online in, in mid-March and, and then we started hearing you know, some folks that we know contracted COVID. We have somebody in our congregation who lost her mother recently from COVID. Several of you have lost your jobs because of the, econo the economic impact of COVID. And uh, in March, Italy became the leading COVID hotspot in the world. And then in March and April, deaths in the U.S., uh, uh, the, the U.S.'s most densely populated city, New York City, peaked with refrigeration trucks outside of the hospital. And then over the summer, as we saw in that graph, most developed countries in the world were able to flatten the curve. They were able to arrest the explosion of COVID-19 cases in their country. But if you remember, here in the United States in June, we started to open back up, and then the new political controversy was, should we wear a mask or not? And so there was a while, while our government leaders were, were, 
were playing a political game of whether they should mandate masks, all the while lifting the shutdown. And in the United States, those cases far outpaced any other developed country in the world. By July 8th, our home state, my home state, at least of Arizona, you may be watching this all over the country, but my home state of Arizona led the world for a while in COVID-19 cases. On July 15th, the White House stripped the CDC of its role in COVID-19 data collection, mandating that it be reported directly to the Department of Health and Human Services closer to the White House. Uh, the Major League Baseball tried to reopen their season um, and uh, was threatened three days in when, when I believe 14 Florida Marlins prayer, uh, players had an outbreak. Um, this past week, a rare heart condition that may be related to COVID was the main reason that at least two of the Power Five conferences in college football have canceled their season in 2020. They were afraid of lawsuits if they put players on the field and they develop this, this heart condition that could be a long-term effect of COVID. And then just a couple of weeks ago, less than that, North Paulding High School in Georgia reopened for in-person class on August 3rd. A student took a cell phone picture of a hallway with, with students wall to wall and almost nobody wearing masks. That school has now reached 35 positive cases. They quarantined 1,200 people in the district, students and teachers, and two high schools had to reclose in that area. And then for us, again, here locally in Arizona, just in the past few days, there has been a, a baffling shift in some school districts. Before, uh, school districts were heeding the state of Arizona guidelines, the benchmarks for reopening, and had online programs in place to start school. And, and just a few days ago, the governor gave a press conference after being uh, with the president in Washington, D.C., and uh, he said that he was okay with districts who were defying the state of Arizona benchmarks. So tomorrow, we have a couple of districts here, just a few miles from where I live, who are reopening for in-person class in schools here in Arizona. And right now, it was reported that Arizona leads the country in pediatric cases of COVID. My wife is a teacher, and Thursday night, we received an email that, that parents, teachers, and principals received at the same time that there had been this mysterious shift that now we were going to move away from online class and start in-person class this coming Monday, next Monday, a week from tomorrow, and that online class would not be supported. So if the students are taking classes online, like our son has, there won't be a teacher there for him. He'll just be on his own to take classes online as a fourth grader. And so my wife and I have been on edge and, and struggling and feeling that anxiety from this mysterious baffling shift all of a sudden in the state of Arizona and a few other Sunbelt states who changed their minds all of the sudden. So as of August 14th, 2020, there have been 760,213 deaths from COVID-19 reported worldwide and in the United States, 167,253, 22% of the total deaths worldwide. And of course, death is not the only risk. There are long-term effects. Once again, most cases are mild. Some people are asymptomatic. But what's being lost in the misinformation and the propaganda is that there are other effects that people feel. Anecdotally, a friend of mine in Ohio who contracted COVID in late March or early April said his sense of taste and smell is back to about 75%. Several months ago, he contracted it and couldn't taste or smell anything for a long time. And so we just don't quite know what the long-term effects are. But doctors and nurses and medical professionals have been trying to break through the noise, the misinformation, the propaganda and say, people are dying, people are suffering, and we can do something about it. But their voices have been drowned out, at least partially, by what we're seeing happening in our country. So our scripture today was um, the scripture in last week's Well Kids Online preschool lesson. 
my youngest son who is four, he loves Well Kids Online. He says he wants to watch his sermon. That's what he calls it. How's that for poor kid lives in a pastor's home, he's a PK, and, and he wants to watch his sermon and they have a Bible verse that the kids memorize and they're at hand motions. And, and he loves to learn his new Bible verse for the week and recite his Bible verse. So for the scripture today, I want to uh, turn it over to my, my bubby, our four-year-old, and let him recite our scripture. Let's watch. Ready? Okay, I'm ready. Go. I am fearfully, wonderfully made. Psalm 149.14. Good job, Bubby. Whoa. There's my Bubby right there. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That com comes from Psalm 39, as he said, uh, verse 14. And then he and I watched that lesson again the other night. And there's a, a part in the lesson where the teacher says, God made you. And he turned to me and he said, Daddy, I thought you made me. Uh, oh man, I'm like we'll talk later, right? Sometimes parenting really is the art of distraction. So his scripture comes from Psalm 139, and I wanted to read uh, the context of Psalm 139. And as we read, we're going to experience a range of emotions. At least the author, the psalmist of this song, that's what psalms mean, songs, praises, they're praise songs. At least the author was feeling a range of emotions from joy to anxiety to anger. And we're going to see that range of emotions as we read our scripture together. So let's read it from Psalm 139, 13 to 24. God, so this is a prayer. God, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. <laughs> How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Did you pray that this morning? I doubt it, but that's the, <laughs> that's the honest emotion of this psalm writer. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you, God, with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord? This is more honest than some Christians are comfortable being. And abhor those who are in rebellion against you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 139. 13 through 24. I actually left out verse 22. It's just so dark. You, you could Google it later if you wanted. When we read this, of course, we, we follow Jesus Christ and we believe that we should love our enemies and we don't want to hate people. We want to love people. But when we read Psalm 139, if, if you're to read it honestly, can you identify with the emotions of the author of this song? The anxiety the anger. Sometimes maybe you do feel like you're tempted to hate. It seems like there are so many people with evil intentions and they affect our lives and our family's safety. And Bono said recently, when he listens to a lot of contemporary Christian music, he doesn't, he doesn't hear honesty like he hears in the Psalms. I don't know, can you identify with the emotion in the psalm. And then there are some interesting things in this, in this passage, especially, you know, the verse that my bubby read, or he, he recited. So the verse says, I am, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of strange. 
It's kind of awkward. I'm fearfully made. What does that mean exactly? I'm fearfully made. And this is, a, this is an instance where there isn't really an English word to translate from the original Hebrew of this passage. And so the translations can be a little awkward. And so the Hebrew word for uh, fearfully, you know, the, the, the word that we ha- translate as fearfully, can mean something like awe-inspiring or, or wonder-producing. So I am, I am made in a way that is awe-inspiring. And then the, the Hebrew word for wonderfully can mean something like u- unique or set apart for a higher purpose, set aside for God's purpose, set aside for something more than, than just the, the mundane. And so verse 14 might be some, saying something like a prayer to God. God, I recognize your greatness because your creation of human beings is awe-inspiring and wonder-producing. And, and you created us to be set apart to partner with you to do good and beautiful things in this world. And that, that whole thing is awe-inspiring. Your creation is wonder producing. And that's true, isn't it? And just the formation of the human body is awe-inspiring. The way our bodies work is wonder producing. We start as this in in a simple form and then we develop and become more and more complex over time. And and we know now that our bodies are made of mostly water and and other chemical compounds. And and the scripture would say, you come from dust and to dust you will return. And they were kind of right. Yeah, we're, we're made from dust. We're made from the same stuff as stars and planets. And, and we understand better now how our bodies function and how complex they are. We've matched the human, or, uh, we've uh, uh, mapped the human genome. We, we know literally what makes us human physically. And it is awe-inspiring. The study of how we are made is anatomy or medical science. So medical researchers and doctors and nurses study the way we are made so they can heal. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you believe that somehow God created humans, and I've given sermons about that before that are available at wellchurch.org, and we don't believe that, or I don't believe that God created the world six years, you know, 6,000 years ago in six literal days, I think our view of creation is bigger than that. But if you believe in some way that God created our bodies, then for a follower of Jesus Christ, medical science is an act of worship. Being a doctor or a nurse is, is studying God's creation. It's, it's an act of of worship, of appreciating and seeing and observing and learning about God's creation. That's why it's so baffling at times. Why so many, peop- so many people of faith in the United States deny science. Or they, they deny the advice of doctors and, and, just, and just brush it aside in favor of, of politics or propaganda or lies. When for a follower of Jesus Christ, studying the human body and practicing medical science is an act of worship, seeking to understand God's creation. And so um, I want to read something that was posted on Facebook by a nurse. This nurse is a, is a friend of a friend of mine. I don't know her. Her name's Courtney. So I know my friend who knows Courtney, and, and Courtney grew up in this area. And Courtney is a, a nurse, and, and she posted this on Facebook, and I'm just going to read what she posted here above her photo. Courtney wrote, not, Courtney wrote, not trying to get too heavy with this post, but I encourage you all to check in on your healthcare friends. I know I'm not the only one who has been having a hard time lately. I know I'm not the only one who has been kept awake, awake night after night suffering with insomnia or terrible nightmares. Nightmares about the body bags and dead people. I wish I could have helped. The patients I watched die alone. I've been a nurse for 13 years and I know I'm not alone when I say that I have seen more death in the last five months than in my entire career. So check in on us. 
We were once praised at the beginning of this pandemic as heroes, and I feel like that support has shifted to people who criticize us or claim that COVID is a hoax, that it's all political, or that we in healthcare are over-dramatizing this. So check in on us. We're still here. We're still on the front lines fighting for you, and we still need your support. We have medical professionals here in our congregation, and this would be an appropriate time for all of us, wherever we are watching this, to say thank you. And if you've been serving and saving lives, and you've experienced things like Courtney, in your, mind, in your mind's eye, I hope you can, you can see and hear all of us right now saying thank you to you. Thank you for, for partnering with God to be a healer and, and bringing life and bringing people back from the brink of death. And thank you for maybe being the only person there when someone has died from this disease in quarantine. Thank you for what you've done. And thank you to all the essential workers, whether you're a, a grocery store cashier or you're working in, a, in, in any uh, public facing retail, whatever you're doing, thank you so much. Teachers, thank you so much for being there and for serving and for making lives better during this time. And, and you know, in verse 20, the psalmist writes, God, there are people who, sp who speak of you with evil intent. And then the psalmist writes, your adversaries misuse your name. That's interesting, isn't it? God, your adversaries misuse your name. So the psalmist is saying there are people who oppose God, but they talk about God a lot. There are people who use God's name as though they're on team God, but they're actually misusing God's name because they oppose what God is doing. They deny the work that God is doing. They, they in a sense, they take God's name in vain. And if, you, if you're like me, you were taught when you were, when you were little, taking God's name is like saying, oh my God. And, and that's true. I mean, that's speaking God's name irreverently. That's true. And this is the third commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. But taking God's name in vain means a lot more than that. It means misusing God's name. Claiming that you are, I don't know, on God's side, or you're God's favorite whatever, and then actually opposing what God is doing. I feel like I'm seeing that in our culture. That there are people who engage in a lot of God talk but they oppose an act of worship like studying God's creation, medical science, and understanding the human body and saying, here's how you protect yourself from a virus. And they, they talk about God a lot, but they misuse his name. And it leads to death and suffering. One of the things that we've seen is that people who are easily manipulated and they believe the propaganda and the lies and they discount doctors and, and medical professionals and they mindlessly repeat the propaganda. They tend to do it loudly and confidently, <laughs> don't they? I've, I've said before, it seems like people who know the least often know it the loudest. So there are people who, who deny science and they, they use God's name to back up their, their views, and they do it so loudly on social media and on cable news. And the noise that they create leads to confusion. It muddies the waters, and so there are sensible people who aren't quite sure exactly what to believe, or, man, I just don't know what to do. It's so confusing. We're receiving so many mixed messages. Is it really safe to put a teacher in a classroom with 30 students. I don't know. Because there, there is so much noise from the propaganda and people repeating that noise. Proverbs 14.3 says, A fool's mouth lashes out with pride, 
but check this out. But the lips of the wise protect them. There are other translations that say, but the lips, the words of the wise preserve them. In other words, a a foolish person just speaks loudly, arrogantly, and with pride. But the words of somebody who is wise can save their own life. I feel like I see that happening right now. That there are so many people who arrogantly and loudly just repeat the propaganda, the misinformation, the political spin, trying to sweep COVID-19 under the rug. That there are, that there are good people, decent people, well-meaning people who feel confused because of the mixed messages. I posted something on my, on my, uh, my social media this past week about uh, George Orwell's book, Animal Farm. And Animal Farm is an, is an allegory about the rise of Stalin in the Soviet Union post-World War II when, when Stalin became a dictator over the Soviet Union. And Orwell uh, uses this, this metaphor, of this allegory of animals on a farm who take over the farm from their human owner. They believe that the human is oppressing them and uh, they lead a rebellion. And specifically, it's a, it's a group of pigs who lead a rebellion against the humans and they overthrow the humans and, and they take over the farm. And at first, it's supposed to be this utopia. And, and, but gradually, things change. And so there's this pig named Napoleon who emerges as a wannabe dictator. Somebody who has different motives than he originally appeared to have. There are people who believed him at first. There were animals who believed him at first, but he's starting to act in strange ways. And he spread the propaganda to the sheep, and the sheep were easily manipulated. And, and so early on, they would justify the rebellion by having the sheep repeat over and over again, four legs good, two legs bad. And that reinforced their animal superiority. And the sheep didn't even know they were sheep. They didn't know they were repeating propaganda. These were, these were just animals who were just repeating what they were told without questioning it, without critical thinking skills. And Orwell uh, describes this as the bleating of the sheep, the bleating of the sheep, B-L-E-A-T-I-N-G, the cries of the sheep, it's over and over again, the bleating of the sheep, the bleating of the sheep was so loud that it drowned out any protest. It drowned out the, the, uh, the questions of people who were wise. And people are like, wait a second, Napoleon, I, I, don't, I don't think what you're doing is right, but the bleating, the bleating of the sheep would drown out with their propaganda the wise people who were trying to speak up. Four legs good, two legs bad, and that was the propaganda for a long time. But then another interesting thing happened as, as Napoleon and, and the rest of the, the pigs in power around him began to grasp for more and more power. They started standing up on their hind legs, just like the humans that they rebelled against. And there's this scene that Orwell describes when the, the pigs led by Napoleon emerged from a barn walking on their, on their hind legs, walking on two legs. And there were wise animals who were thinking, Wait, what's going on here? We've been told that walking on two legs is bad. That was, the, that was the information we were given. What's going on here? But before they could question, before wise animals could point out the obvious hypocrisy and the lies that were leading to this dictatorship, the sheep had been given a new form of propaganda. And the, the bleeding of the sheep now over and over and over again was uh, four... Uh, two legs, uh, four legs good, two legs better. And Orwell says for five minutes, the sheep just repeated this propaganda over and over, four legs good, two legs better. And they, they, they bleated so loudly and for so long that they drown out any protest until the pigs went back into the barn. And the wise people who knew what was going on were silenced. 
That's how dictators take power. They spread propaganda, lies, and misinformation. And then people who don't even know they're being manipulated, people who don't even know that they're being used, repeat that mindlessly over and over and over. And it's so loud and confident. And they, they, they do it so much that the voices of people who know medical professionals and doctors and, and wise people who are not science deniers and people who care about the safety of their families and their, and, and their voices are drowned out by the bleating of the sheep. Don't let propaganda drown out your voice. How do you deal with this second form of anxiety? The misinformation and, and this realization that there are so many people who easily believe that and they repeat lies and it's made us all less safe and it's caused the United States to be by far the leader in COVID cases among other countries in the developed world. And it will continue to this fall in this winter if we continue down this path. When you hear the, the bleating of the sheep, it's so loud. Folks, don't let the propaganda drown out your voice. Speak up. Stand for what's true. Stand for what's right. Realize that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, medical science is an act of worship. And we can speak up and, 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 and be smart. And there are people who are hurting economically because of the shutdown. You can speak up and say, I think we need to help individuals and businesses that are suffering because of the shutdown. We need to do more to help them. As a, as a people, we need to do more than, to help them. We can pass laws to help them. That's what government's for. In the Hebrew scripture, in the Old Testament, kings and queens, which were the government of that time, were charged with carrying out justice and righteousness. We talked about that last, last, uh, last week. Righteousness means doing what's right by everybody. That's the point of government, is to do what's right by everybody. People need help. We could deal with the pandemic, and we can help people who are suffering economically. We could do both of those things if we don't let the propaganda drown out our voices. One of the pieces of propaganda that we've seen has been the oldest trick in the book. It's scapegoating. Blaming people who have nothing to do with our bungling as a country of, of COVID-19, the mishandling of COVID-19, blaming those folks who had nothing to do with it. And it's just shifting the blame, using other people as a distraction for the failures of leaders or a leader to deal with COVID-19 in a wise way. And so we've seen this technique uh, be used to, to call uh, COVID-19 the China virus. Well, that's the country of origin, but then it was taken far beyond that using terms like Kung flu, a mocking anti-Asian term to refer to coronavirus. And so the Anti-Defamation League has reported that there has been an increase of assault and uh, verbal attacks against Asian Americans in the United States. On July 31st in the Bronx, a man was arrested after harassing an Asian woman on the subway. The man reportedly spat on the woman and yelled at her, Asians caused the virus, go back to China, go back to Manhattan. Oh, okay. <laughs> go back to Manhattan, I'm not sure what that means, but attacking an Asian woman on the subway. July 18th, an Asian American restaurant owner says he was attacked by a man who refused to comply with the restaurant's health measures. The man allegedly told the restaurant owner, and this is safe for kids today, blank you and your, he used a, a, an ethnic slur toward Asians, blank policy and told him, go back to China, you COVID blank. July 17th in New Jersey, a Chinese restaurant was vandalized with graffiti that read coronavirus and COVID-19. I have friends who are Asian Americans. A good friend of mine who's been a friend of mine for a long time is an Asian American. We have folks in our congregation who are Asian American. And one of the ways that I don't want to let the propaganda drown out the truth is I want to stick up for my friends. 
because this is even a, this is more uh, this is bigger than just coronavirus. This is a technique that's been used in the United States for hundreds of years. We've been awakening to that now in the Black Lives Matter movement this summer. There, there are friends of mine, I've heard kind of say this kind of half facetiously, racism is the reason we can't have nice things. Because anytime, anytime we want to make progress, race is used to divide us and to, to, to blame scapegoat folks who have, who have no blame. But racism is used as propaganda in this country to distract us from what's really our struggle, to distract us from what would really solve our problems, like the economic issues we talked about last week. And so what I wanted to do was end today by playing a video of a few minutes of um, a member of our congregation who is an Asian American sharing about her experience. And for me personally, as a, as a white male pastor, this is a way to not let propaganda drown out the truth. I want to speak out on behalf of medical science as an act of worship and say we, we need to listen to doctors and medical professionals. I also want to speak out on behalf of my friends who are being scapegoated and, and blamed for something that they have nothing to do with. And so Christine Bennett, as a member of our congregation, her and her husband Matthew have been a part of the well and their two kids and, and um, they're great people. And, I sat down you know, on a video chat with Christine this past week and, and pre-recorded this talk and I just asked her several questions about her experience growing up as an Asian American and how the current COVID-19 crisis is affecting her as an Asian American. And so um, let's watch. Christine, thanks for sharing with us today. Really appreciate it. I know it's not the easiest subject to talk about and, and even preparing for this, I've been moved by what you've had to share. And so thank you so much for being willing to share with us today. And um, is it okay if we, we start at the beginning? Yeah, um, sure. it, There's no better place to begin than at the beginning. So tell us about your, your childhood. When, when did you first become aware of, of race and ethnicity? Yeah, um, I was born in Texas to immigrant parents. And both my parents came to the States from the Philippines back in the 80s. And up until I was 10 years old, most of the people I knew and were friends with were Filipinos or Filipino Americans like me. And if you know any Filipinos, most of the time they've got this really tight knit community. And that's what I was familiar with for a good amount of my childhood. I, I don't know if it was the reality, but as a kid, it felt like we were always hanging out at someone's house. Didn't matter if it was like a baptism, whatever, or just hanging out. It always, we were so close and just a really good community. And um, in fifth grade, we started moving around a little bit. And I suspect in combination with pre-adolescence, I started becoming very aware of how I appeared to other people and actually started caring about it. So it was the first time that my closest friends weren't Filipino like me. And it was in seventh grade when I first moved to Arizona that my closest friends were all white. And because I was at that age that I wanted to start wearing makeup and wearing clothes that I felt were cool, not the stuff my parents picked out, uh, I started buying magazines geared toward teens. And I mean, I had to know what was cool. So I have this memory of getting frustrated with an eye makeup tutorial because after following the directions, it didn't look at all like the end results picture because my eyelids are a little bit different. And whatever they call the crease, like it, it's not the same on my eyes, like on many Caucasian women's eyes. And I couldn't go Asian makeup tutorial or something like that to get something closer to the results I wanted. Um, and it may seem like a small thing to not have a tutorial, like a makeup tutorial that I could refer to, but it was a lot of little messages like that that I was receiving, besides all the body image stuff that you get as a as a girl, um, that being white equaled being pretty. And so my friends, again, most of whom were white, were dating boys or at least had some interest in them. And all the images I was seeing in magazines, on TV, in the movies of beautiful, successful women who were doing something with their lives were mostly white. And I remember my family getting so excited and proud when we'd find out like someone uh, like finding a famous Filipino. So like the voice of Princess Jasmine and Mulan's singing voice, that's Leia Salonga, uh, Cassandra in Wayne's World, Tia Carrere, who is part Filipino. 
and Rob Schneider of uh, SNL and tons of Adam Sandler movies. Uh, he's half Filipino. Needless to say, we watch a lot of Adam Sandler movies in our house. And nowadays, I feel like I'm seeing so many more Asians, including Filipinos, in the spotlight, which is very exciting. I can't tell you what it feels like to watch movies or TV that, that has people in leading roles that look more like you and are three-dimensional characters, not just the best friend or some kind of stereotypical like nerd, smart person. And um, what it feels like to see Filipino Americans on the screen actually playing people who are Filipinos, not another Asian ethnicity, which is pretty common with Asian actors. They're one ethnicity, they're playing another ethnicity. Um, I do get choked up sometimes when I watch these things because most of my life, and I didn't realize this, like really become truly aware of it until recently was that I was trying so hard to be white. And because, because deep in my brain, it had been communicated to me that being white uh, is the ideal. So that's a little bit of that. Thank you for sharing that, Christine. And, and now as you, as you grew up, can you tell me about, tell us about um, some of the instances of racism and microaggressions that you experienced as, a, as an Asian American? Yeah, so I've been really lucky to not have any aggressive or violent experiences of racism. A lot of the stuff has just been ignorance and I don't wanna sound like the jerk and like call out, hey, that's racist, you. Uh, so a lot of it, I, I really just let slide. Um, which probably isn't the best way to go about it either. Uh, I've been told on many occasions that I sound white. Uh, I once had a conversation with someone over the phone and then I met them in person and they're like, oh wow, judging from your voice, I thought you were white, like just straight to my face. <laughs> and uh, My favorite is when people ask me where I'm from and I'm like, oh, I'm from Texas. And they're like, no, 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 where, where were you born? I'm like, I was born in Texas. <laughs> um, and I, I make it a point to not give them the answer that I know that they're trying to ask. They're trying to see like what my ethnicity is, but just kind of point out like, oh no, no like we can, I can look Asian and, you know, be from America. Uh, but yeah, and, and then just the usual Asian stereotypes, like I experience a lot of that. Like even nowadays people joke about it and I kind of just eh, brush it off because sometimes it's just not worth the effort to uh, point out, but yeah. A lot of these things happened to me a lot more 10 years ago than it does now. So I'm really hoping that means there's progress being made. Absolutely, I mean, we hope so, certainly. And, and now let's take it a little bit deeper. Um, tell me about your experiences as an Asian American in church from, from just the, the perspective yeah, so... of the, the country of America, but down to now the experience of church. Oh boy. Um, yeah. <laughs> Let's have so, fun now. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, well, I grew up Catholic, and if there is anything that I do miss about attending Mass, it's how much more diverse it was in my experience. Um, it is the biggest Christian denomination in the world, like billion people identify as Catholic. So I don't think I ever felt like I was the only person of color in the room. Um, but once I started attending evangelical churches, I definitely felt much more out of place. At first, I was in love with the evangelical church because I wasn't falling asleep during service. The music was great. People were super nice. But as the years passed by, the honeymoon phase was over. I started feeling more and more uncomfortable at these churches that were supposed to be my home. But rarely did anyone in leadership look like me or just look like not a white man. <laughs> um, it was difficult being a part of some churches that didn't allow women to be pastors or elders because they deemed it not biblical. Um, something a bit more insidious because of the teachings I was hearing and the people I was surrounded by, I started believing that I wasn't good enough, that if people at church really knew who I was, like they would not be cool with me being involved. Um, so representation really does matter and bad theology can be very traumatic. So I, I came to a point where I was tired of attending a church that didn't believe women, women could be a pastor or an elder, that didn't seem to make an effort to show diverse points of view by including people of color and sexual orientation on Sunday mornings and in their leadership. And I mean, my own children, uh, who can definitely pass for white, 
uh, what message are they receiving? That pushing their Filipino side, um, you know, pushing that aside will will help them look better in the eyes of the church. Um, that only straight white males are worthy of teaching on Sundays. That the way to live this life is to try and make yourself like someone else. Um, it, it took me back to my childhood, this line of questioning when I, before I knew about nose jobs, like trying to pinch my nose and so that I could have a more European nose and look more white. And yeah, uh, so it was around that time when I was asking myself and my husband, Matthew, these questions that my deconstruction journey started. And that was about two years ago. So I was tired of trying to make myself fit in a community that was making no effort to, you know, have people different from them. And we took a break from church for a little while. I had so much stuff built up over the years that being the best Christian I could be meant that I should quit my job, be a stay at home mom who has a Pinterest worthy home um, and never disturbs the peace, doesn't question anything. And honestly, I don't think that was the intention of any of the churches that I attended, but like that's what the messaging and what I felt was happening around me. So, I mean, the evangelical church welcomed me with open arms, but once I was in, I had to fit in a box to feel like I could be accepted. But um, yeah, uh, you know, when I was younger, a lot of these things I might have just brushed off and I wanted to be this chill Filipino American that didn't cause any trouble. And it's only within the past couple of years that I feel really tired. Like I'm tired of uh, not being able to feel like I can embrace my Filipino side. I'm tired of feeling that being American is better. And it's a reality and a sad thought for me to have that my kids who are half white and barely look Asian, if at all some days, that looking more white allows them to pass for white, perhaps opening up more opportunity for them. And when they receive these subtle messages that the more you can pass, the better off you'll be, how is getting in touch with their Filipino side supposed to compete? Because I received the same message growing up and it's only now in my 30s that I'm learning about where I came from, how Filipinos have been treated in this country, in their own country, and how it explains the mental stress I've lived with all my life. So I touched a little bit outside of church too, but yeah. Well, it's certainly applicable. And I mean, that leads us into, how, how have you dealt with the reality of racism you know, personally throughout your life? I mean, there's this growing realization as I hear you talk that there has been an anxiety present in your life that maybe you didn't, you couldn't name before, yeah. but you're fully able to see it now. Yeah. Uh, how do you deal with the reality of racism personally? Well, I will tell you um, something that has been a light in my identity confusion is the church, ironically. Um, I have a complicated history as I think most of us do, but through many, any confusing moments I had trying to figure out where I belonged and who I was, the message of Christ um, welcoming me. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Rest! Uh, assuring me that peace was possible, like that whatever was going on in my life, inside my mind, all this anxiety and depression that there was a light at the end of the tunnel. And as I've gone through and continue to go through deconstruction, reconstruction, I can't quite bring myself to step away from the church and God completely. So I've had bad experiences with the church, with church communities, but I've also had some pretty amazing ones. Uh, ones where people have stood beside me and weathered some pretty dark storms um, alongside me. And there are people in my life that believed in God and love and people and have helped me find the light when I'm stuck in the darkness. So I can't quit church forever. Can't quit God forever. I don't think um, we're really meant to live in community. And as much as I try to fight it, especially as an introvert, uh, I know that I'm better around other people. I'm better with others, we all are. And there is something so very divine about people who support and care for each other. And so I, I'm super grateful that I'm part of this community that truly welcomes me as I am, a big old stress ball who's still trying to figure out what she believes. And I'm so grateful that it accepts people of all sexual orientations, like, or, and people just wherever they are at um, and give spotlight to different voices. So thank you for this opportunity. And thank you for everyone at the well, like just making it it's such a special place. Well, thank you for your kind words. And, and we certainly value you here. And you and you and Matthew are important parts of our community and your kids. And we really appreciate you. And 
I mean, finally, if if you would share just how has the current anti-Asian racism surrounding COVID-19 affected you? That there has to be extra anxiety, I would imagine, <laughs> yeah, during this time. So would you would you mind sharing a little bit about that? Yeah. So it's definitely heartbreaking to hear and read about stories from Asians and Asian Americans and their experiences with the racism uh, during the pandemic. Like I'm hearing stories of people who aren't Chinese being on the receiving end of anti-Chinese remarks and jokes because Asians tend to get lumped into one big group of people that all look alike. So <laughs> I have definitely adjusted my behavior when I'm out and about because I am Asian and people who don't know me or just don't see enough Asians to know that we don't actually all look alike and aren't Chinese. Um, I try not to make eye contact with people when I'm out in public. Uh, I really don't want to have to deal with the possibility of people giving me a weird look, a stare, or hearing a racist comment under someone's breath. Uh, so I try to be as invisible as possible and get in and out um, as quickly as I can. Um, it's especially great when I have to sneeze or cough or clear my throat when I'm out because I'm like, oh god, I don't want I don't want people to have an excuse to like give me a weird stare. Um, again. I'm fortunate that I haven't received any, any anti-Asian racism during the pandemic, but it's definitely on the back of my mind that it might happen. Christine, thank you so much for sharing with us today. Thank you. When uh, we recorded this, Christine asked me, are you sure you want me to share this much, like share this long? And I said, oh, for sure. I wanted her to be able to tell just a little bit of her story because when the history books are written on 2020 and there, there will be a lot to write, it will have to include that there were people who denied science, that there were people who disseminated propaganda and people who mindlessly repeated propaganda to the extent that the United States led the world, the developed world by far in cases of COVID, but there's going to be another story to tell about 2020 as well. On my best days, at least, I believe that 2020 could be a watershed year for the United States. We have been faced with the uglier parts of our history and lies and propaganda and that ugliness has showed us, um, that ugliness has, sh has shown us how beautiful the alternative is. That we can, we can live into something better as a people. Yes, there were people who, who resorted to racism, to, to scapegoat the fact that they didn't handle cor you know, coronavirus and, and we witnessed the, the murder of a black man for almost nine minutes. But we can turn a corner. And we can decide as a people that there are better days ahead when we don't have to live out of the uglier parts of our history. But we can embrace a story that is far more beautiful and good and just and righteous. As the psalmist uh, wrote, Search me, God. Test me if there's any offensive way in me. Show me, and I want to follow you and, and what's good and true and what leads to life, preserving life and living a great life. And I believe we have that opportunity as a people. And so don't let the propaganda drown out your voice. I invite you to pray with me. God, thank you for Christine sharing Thank you for the voices of doctors and nurses and, and medical professionals like Dr. Lee and, and Courtney and, and folks in our congregation and folks who are, who are watching now from different parts of the country and who have devoted their lives to what I view, what we view as an act of worship, understanding your creation that is fearfully and wonderfully made. Thank you for the workers who have been on the front lines. Thank you for the teachers who are about to go to the front lines. And God, we have heard 
really at times an unbelievable amount of propaganda, of misinformation, of lies. And without even realizing it, just like Animal Farm, there were so many people who repeated that propaganda over and over again, loudly and confidently. And the bleeding of the sheep has muddied the waters and it's led to confusion. God, we pray for the strength, the courage to not let the propaganda drown out our voice. Search our hearts, test us. God, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We know that full well. And we can embrace medical science. We can embrace facts. And God, we can embrace the fact that all of us are created to be fearfully and wonderfully made regardless of race or ethnicity. And we don't have to let racism be another form of propaganda that distracts us from the, the issues that we need to address. We can, we can embrace something far more beautiful than that. God, we thank you. We pray for teachers going back into the classroom now in some parts of the country. We pray for their protection. And while we pray that, God, we want to be the answer to our own prayers. And so may we speak up for their protection.